Welcome to John's Corner, where our star reporter Jonathan always lands on his feet. He's a hard-hitting reporter who isn't afraid to throw a punch or to take one. He's always investigating the issues that others shy away from, uncovering even the biggest of scandals, while learning every secret he can. Here on John's Corner. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to John's Corner, Blue Roof Productions' only talk show at the moment. I will hopefully have more and have more time, and life will be easier and more enjoyable. And anyway, um, so today we have some fun things to talk about. I know I'm a little late to the the party, but uh, a lot has been going on in my life lately. But uh, crisis on infinite earth. I know. Missed the, oh my god, I'm going to talk about it. But I just want to talk about it. Because, oh my god, it was so cool. Um, so let's let's start. Now, it's a five-episode crossover between Supergirl, Batwoman, The Flash, Arrow, and Legends. But Black Lightning kind of also has a part in that. Um, we've gotten three and a half, because Black Lightning is not a full episode of it, but it is very central to the storyline. So let's just let's just dive into it. Now the hype for this was unparalleled. I think there's even more hype for this than Endgame, and I'm a Marvel fan, and I'm saying there was more hype for this. Every week you'd hear, "Oh, so and so's in it." Now, "Oh, so and so's in it." Oh, they're tying this, they're tying that, they're tying everything. I was I've never been more excited for anything in my life than I was for this. And when it finally came, it lived up to it. So let's let's just dive into it. Now we know. In the Arrowverse, as it stands now in the CW, there's three worlds that are mainly used. There's Earth-1, which is Arrow, Flash, and Legends. Um, there's Earth-30-something, I forget it off the top of my head. But that's uh, Cara Danvers, that's Supergirl's world. And there's the Black Lightning Earth, who they don't give us a name for. What number is the Black Lightning Earth? Just tell me. I want to know. But, um... So those are the three main Earths that we deal with a lot. And so on, on Batgirl, I'm not, I don't want to give too much spoilers about what's going on, but there will be spoilers. Um, I just want to talk about the, the... You know what? We'll do a spoiler-centric episode in January after it's done, and we'll just dive into everything. Because I know a lot of people who are waiting until they can watch all five together. I just want to talk about... We're giving spoilers. We're giving spoilers. I don't care. Um, okay, so Supergirl starts off, and it's real. It starts off where the Flash and um, Arrow left off. Both those shows end with the crisis starting. So this episode starts with the crisis starting, and it's right off the bat we see. Um, well, the first one we see is the reporter dude from Batman '89 in his world dying. So they bring in the Tim Burton Batverse, which I'm just like, oh my god, I, that's my Batman growing up, even before Adam West. And then they do um, the Titans world, and they blow that up, and it's like, hold on, Titans is one of the best shows on TV right now, you can't be doing that. And then they blow up Burt Ward, the original Batman, they went to Batman 66. And Titans is, is Earth-9. I don't know the relevance of that, but the 89 one is Earth-89, and then the Tim Burton one is Earth-66. I mean, not the, the Adam West one is Earth-66. Like, I just I love the, day, the way they're naming the Earths. Um, if you if you watch the after shows, they, they said Kevin Smith, Earth-420. I was like, okay, that's funny. Um, anyways, so then we get into the episode proper, and it's all about Supergirl's world dying, and they... Spoiler alert, they kill off Oliver in the first episode of the crossover. Like, who the hell would have thought that was a good idea? Like, I figured he would die heroically at the end of the series. They kill him off like that. It, it broke my heart. Like, I was I was crying like a little child. Um, but that episode was so good. And then the next episode, um, they 
They show us the Birds of Prey, which I think I'm the only person who remembers that show, but it was fun back in the day, so they, they blow up that earth. And then they go in search of the these these mythical figures who are supposed to be only seven people who could help them. And basically, they just go to different Superman worlds. And why I love these people, the people who create these shows, is if you remember Superman Returns, it's a sequel to Superman 1 and 2, but it disregards three and four. So when they were looking for a Superman, they first find they first go to um, Earth seventy seven, where Superman lays dead. Seventy seven is when the original Superman movie came out. They even though they have they have both the Superman from three and four and the Superman from Returns. Now Superman from three and four, Lex Luthor killed, but Christopher Reeves is dead in real life, so that makes sense. And then you have Ren and Ruth Superman, who is... I did not like Superman Returns. I did not think it was a good movie. But oh my god, he needs to play Superman more. He was so great in this. And then they go to they go to Smallville. And we see Clark. And it pays off from the comics left off. That it's just... You see one last scene in the Smallville universe. It's just... It's pure fan service. Just making fans feel good about life. But oh my god, it was so heart wrenching and emotional and just oh my god, it was perfection. I just I just want to give these writers they all deserve like Emmys or Oscars or Emmys I guess for TV right. They all they all deserve awards. These people are geniuses. Then you get the Black Lightning. Oh, and then how could we forget Kevin Conroy as bitter old Bruce Wayne? Like, that was genius. Like, they brought in the best Batman. Batman from the animated series. And they brought him into live action. It was... Seeing him play Bruce Wayne is one of the highlights of television ever. I mean, they made him an asshole Bruce Wayne and not, like, you know, a good inspiring Bruce Wayne. But still, I just loved seeing him play Bruce Wayne for the first time in live action, you know? Um, then you get the Black Lightning episode, and uh, it's still daring very much with what's happening in on their Earth, but then it's kind of like the end of Arrow and Flash, where it's the crisis happening, and their Earth destroyed, and you see Jefferson disappear. But I like that they tied into this crossover, but then also gave uh, his daughter, who was kind of having a crisis of faith, and kind of split loyalties, they made her face other versions of herself who made different choices and she's now like oh maybe I'm not on the right path maybe I need to readjust what I'm doing so it's also pushing that storyline forward because we know this is all getting undone right like we're not we're not sitting there thinking oh my god it's all done my lightning got canceled titans got canceled doom patrol got canceled no <laughs> no one believes that um so then it brings us the flash episode where they visit 666 Earth. Lucifer. What? I love that show. Um, so. And then the craziest thing happens at the end. Spoilers. Which is why I'm, I'm so mad at these people. How are you going to make it through a month? Earth 1 is destroyed. The only people left are the par the seven paragons of truth. Except Brendan Rose Superman was replaced by Lex Luthor. Well, let's just say he's an amazing Lex Luthor. Dude is fucking genius. I can't wait a month. To, I guess now we don't have to wait a month. There's only a couple more weeks. But oh my, I can't. I'm just so excited. I just want to see what happens next. Tell me. It is so good. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm really loving it. Um, this is how you do a crossover. You do it right. Like, they're, they're blending in all these TV. It, it really reminds me watching it of um, Marvel Comics back in the day. Not, not so much now. Well, actually, you know what? I take that back. The, the um, Don of X series that Jonathan Hickman and all those guys are doing, it annoys the hell out of me because you have six X books all being released twice a month. Who can afford that? But whatever. You want to rip off your customers and charge them an excessive amount of money? Fine. Uh, the point is, those stores are kind of doing that now. Where what happens in one pays tribute to the other one, and you don't see the character. If a character is in one story, he's not in the other story, or it takes place after that story. Where there's real care to continuity and to making sure that everything fits together just right. 
which is what Marvel Comics used to do, and it's what this show is taking such pains to do. And I love it. Love it. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we're going to talk about nerdy things that just happened in hype. Let's uh, let's get into the unfortunate business. Um, I'm not going to give spoilers for this one because the movie literally just came out. But uh, Star Wars Rise of the Skywalker. Um, I, I've made a point of saying like, I don't want to be negative about things and I don't want to talk down on things and tear things apart. But... <sighs> All right. Let's just... All right, let's just, um, let's, let's, let's take this one step at a time. Now, I end everything I do with Give Us Legends. Obviously, I'm a Star Wars EU fan. Long live the extended universe. It's the book I'm currently reading. Um, so I'm already kind of predisposed to be like, this isn't my Star Wars, this isn't my stories. But... And and this this counts Solo and Rogue One. Um, Solo had a mess of problems, a whole mess of problems. That I'm just like, did, did you even? Which I, it, it comes from having I guess it's the same problem Justice League had. You have two different directors with different visions coming in and reworking each other. It doesn't mesh. Plus Darth Maul coming back. I just okay. Um, and then Rogue One. Was actually Rogue One's not a bad movie, but it answers a question that you didn't need answering. You made a plot hole in A New Hope just to solve it in this movie. It's pointless, but whatever. Not not here to talk about those movies. Let's just talk about the sequel trilogy. Uh, Force Awakens. I did a whole clean jeans episode about how much I disliked it. Um, and let's let's talk about why I disliked it for a moment. Um, so when I was moving to Texas, I was reading, uh, that's when I, I was really into the Star Wars novels, still in, but at the time, um, I was reading New Jedi Order, and they were referencing Jaina Solo as the Sword of the Jedi. That was her destiny. They've been building that for so long, and in October of that year, the first of the Sword of the Jedi trilogy was supposed to come out. In April of that year, and not just April of that year, but the... April of that year, they decided they were throwing out the EU. And it wasn't just any April. It was a writer by the name of Aaron Alistair had just died. And he was a big EU writer. And Disney said, we're throwing out the EU. It's, it's a cluttered mess. It's not coherent. And we want to have complete creative control and not be held to these previous stories. Because people don't want to go into a story confused. That was what they said. And then there was article after article bashing the EU and everything in it. And they made this announcement the same weekend that that writer was being buried. And it became even more of a fuck you to not only him, but to his fans and to EU fans in general. When you watch The Force Awakens, and The Force Awakens is really, is really just a mixture of A New Hope and Legacy of the Force. Like it just took plot elements from those two things. And he wrote one third of Legacy of the Force. So... You want to do something completely creative and original and new, you stole that guy's ideas and pass it off as... And you, forget, you own both, so you can't steal from yourself. But you said you wanted to do something new that had nothing to do with that. And then you stole so many plot points from that. It, it, had, it, it took the story beats from A New Hope. Like, that's all it did. Then it also was like, let's play nostalgia cards. And this was the third movie that year to do it because Creed did it. I mean, Creed was to the point where you knew how Creed was going to end way before you got to the ending because it was Rocky redone. But it was good and it was, you could tell that it loved Rocky. When you watched Creed, it wasn't, how can I make money off of the Rocky fans? It was, I love Rocky so much. That yes, we're gonna make a new movie in that universe, but we want to pay tribute to that movie. That movie is damn near perfect, and we want to honor it. And that's what Creed came across. It came off across as a love letter to Rocky. It had the same story beats, but it was a love letter to Rocky. Jurassic World, 
It was very reminiscent of Jurassic Park. But it was fun, and it was making fun of itself while it did it. The Force Awakens wasn't making fun of itself, and it wasn't a love letter to the original. You can't say that it was, because it undid everything that Return of the Jedi did. Uh, Han Solo, the rogue scoundrel who finally found a place in the world and was a part of something larger than himself and finally got his life together. Oh no, him and Chewie, they lost everything. They lost their ship. Their life is more of a wreck than ever before. Like, you literally deconstructed the character and took everything from him. And it was just like, what was the point of that? And then the galaxy, the end of Return of the Jedi, you defeated the Empire and you think that there was going to be peace in the galaxy. But this one, it's... The First Order, which is really just the Empire Redux, fighting the Resistance, which is really just the Rebel Alliance. Like, you just redid the movie. Like, what was the point of that? You call it a sequel, but it's a remake. It's literally taking the beats of it. And it wasn't even, I don't know, man. It just, and then it was just, let's, every 10 minutes, let's drag out nostalgia. Oh, here's a nostalgia. Oh, here's a nostalgia. Oh, here's a nostalgia. Oh, you didn't earn any of the nostalgia. It wasn't anything. It wasn't artfully done like it was in Creed. It wasn't self-referential like it was in Jurassic World. It was just, oh, well, this will get a reaction out of you. Oh, this will get a reaction out of you. But most importantly, it didn't feel like a Star Wars movie. It didn't take the time to breathe. And the characterization felt forced. And there wasn't, I just, The Force Awakens was not, I don't know, like, I, I watched it and I tried to get out of my own head and enjoy it. I just, I couldn't, it just, it was missing the essence of what makes a Star Wars movie. And it didn't try to do anything new. Empire Strikes Back is very different than A New Hope. Return of the Jedi is very different than Empire Strikes Back. Phantom Menace is very different than that. Attack of the Clones is very different. Uh, Revenge of the Sith, very different. They're all very different movies that all fit in the same world and all doing different things. This one was trying to do A New Hope without the heart, without taking the character beats, without really letting those characters breathe. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I feel like it's JJ. <laughs> but, you know, he, he then set up a new emperor. He set up new Darth Vader, set up all this stuff, and, and that, that right there, okay, part of what annoys me and a lot of other EU fans is all the trash that was talked by so-called Star Wars fans and the media about the EU, and a lot of the attacks were, oh, your characters are overpowered, there's so many different super weapons, oh, you brought the Emperor back, all this shit, they, they just, they kept talking. Oh, the stuff doesn't even make sense in its own timeline. Rah, rah, rah. And it is people contradict. Oh, and my favorite, my favorite is, oh, it was a bunch of different writers contradicting each other. That was my favorite criticism about the EU and why it's trash. Well, so JJ gives us a super weapon that can destroy multiple planets at a time, which, uh, well, EU did, and uh, they call it the Sun Crusher. It shoots a missile into the sun, blows up a whole solar system, destroying numerous planets at a time. So, you know, yeah, your, your super weapon destroys multiple planets, so does ours. You kind of, yeah, you can't, you can't criticize super weapons anymore, especially after uh, Rise of Skywalker. You can't criticize us having too many or too powerful super weapons, because uh, you guys did that. Um, now, contradicting previous writers, you can make the argument that The Force Awakens contradicts Return of the Jedi. It undid everything that Return of the Jedi did. Well, then you get The Last Jedi, which Ryan Johnson at least understands Star Wars. <laughs> I know The Last Jedi gets a lot of hate, especially for the cantina scene, which I don't know. Has, has nobody ever seen a Star Wars movie? The cantina scene was... Well, not the cantina, the casino scene. The casino scene was quintessential Star Wars. Let's take a break from the main storyline and go on this random tangent for a moment. That is such a Star Wars thing to do. Let's just breathe, let's just live and breathe with these two characters. 
and get to know them and get to relate to them and get to feel what they're feeling. That is Star Wars. That scene that everybody hates was the most Star Wars scene out of all of the sequel trilogies. I, I, just, I don't understand why people don't understand that. But here's the thing. Ryan Johnson did some things incredibly well. He got the feel of a Star Wars movie, and he got the structure of a Star Wars movie. He intellectually understands what a Star Wars movie is. In my personal opinion, you could take it or leave it if you want, is also where he went wrong. Because he then said, well, let's deconstruct the Star Wars movie. And if you want to make a movie about legacy is meaningless and there's no such thing as destiny i'm on board i will watch that movie but when you make that movie the eighth installment in a saga that is all about legacy and destiny it's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way you like that movie basically just said that everything that star wars has been about doesn't matter and that is what the problem with that movie is. That's the problem I have with that movie. Is you spit in the face of everything that Star Wars is supposed to be about. Legacy and destiny. Those are the two central themes that have been there through everything else. And Ryan Johnson said, fuck those themes. You can argue all you want about the merits of the good movie, whether or not that was a good choice. But that movie, if you're paying attention, is legacy and destiny are meaningless and don't, they're just meaningless. They don't matter. And if you watch all the other Star Wars movies, it's all about how important legacy and destiny is. You can't make the second to last installment say, fuck everything we've done so far. But that's what he did. That's why a lot of people, even if they can't explain why they hate the movie, that's why they hate it. They, they might blame the casino scene, they might say this, they might say that. It's because of that. It's because he spit in the face of the main themes of the franchise. But that's not all he did. He also, J.J. set Snokes up as the new Emperor, kills him off. He says Kylo Ren up as the new uh, Darth Vader, immediately destroys the mask and has him immediately on a quasi-redemptive path. Um, you set up that Ray's parents are supposed to be interest. Or you set up that Ray's parents are somebody important, and then oh, Ray's parents are nobody. Like, everything that J.J. Abrams set up, Ryan Johnson said, fuck you, we're not doing any of that. I'm destroying every single plot line you set out to create. So then that brings us to Rise of the Skywalker, which was two hours and 20 minutes. But there were not really any character beats. Not, not really. I mean, there were some, but they kind of felt forced and... You didn't really get to breathe with any of the characters. There was no fun side adventure. There was so much plot to unpack. And you know why? Because half that movie was literally undoing everything Ryan Johnson did to reattach it to The Force Awakens. That's what the first half of that movie is. It's how do we undo everything that Ryan Johnson did so that I could finish the story I started in The Force Awakens. They brought the Emperor, spoiler alert in case you're unaware, uh, they brought the Emperor back, they, oh, Ray's parents are nobody, but her grandfather is Palpatine, uh, oh, let's turn Kylo Ren all the way evil again, and then redempt him again, which you kind of did in The Last Jedi, you don't really need to do it again, like, either have him be completely redeemed or not redeemed, oh, and The Last Jedi, the way they killed off Luke Skywalker... First of all, the way Han Solo died in The Force Awakens? Bullshit. The way they killed off Luke Skywalker? Bullshit. Leia's the only death that they gave any respect to. She died saving her son. I can respect that. A lot of people... like That's the only classy death they gave any of the legacy characters. But... It's just... And then every Star Destroyer was basic, basically a Death Star. And it's like, okay, hold on. So I just want to take a moment for all the EU haters out there. So many of them on my timeline. I just want to take a moment to say you're a fucking hypocrite 
who has no integrity. Because let's let's be honest, you love these movies, but the EU was a cluttered mess. So let's, let's go through the criticisms of the EU and why this was necessary. Um, well, the biggest criticism was too many different writers contradicting each other. Well, we got that. Uh, Ryan Johnson contradicted J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams contradicted Ryan Johnson. So you got that. You got the contradicting each other. Uh, too many super weapons. Well, you definitely got that. Too powerful super weapons. You got that. Uh, overpowered characters. You got that. I mean, you look at you look at Anakin and Luke Skywalker's training through the original movies. I, the one thing I will give the Rise of Skywalker is the first time they showed Rey training and not immediately knowing anything. I mean, in Force Awakens, Finn, who's a stormtrooper, has no force powers, no nothing, is deflecting blaster bolts with a lifesaver. What? Whatever. Um... Was he deflecting blaster bolts with blaster? Or was he, he was battling with lightsaber. Whatever. A stormtrooper should not be using a lightsaber. So stupid. Um, and Finn did not get nearly. He's one of the main characters of this franchise. He did not really get an emotional story arc in this this movie. He should have had more. They gave Poe an emotional story. They gave Rey. They gave Kylo Ren. Finn, they just kind of left there. I mean, he was a part of it all, but they did not give him a significant moment. They robbed his character of a lot. And, and they, they set up significant moments for his character. But then they never paid them off. I don't know if there's a longer version of this movie somewhere where it's paid off, but... And then... The ending was just right off of Return of the Jedi. Oh, we defeated the Empire. Oh, it's like, you done that. <laughs> nothing, nothing changed. But it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't capture the magic of Star Wars, and it damn sure didn't have the structure of Star Wars. I don't know, man. I think out of all of these, Last Jedi is the only one that feels like a Star Wars movie, even though it said fuck you to the premise of Star Wars. <laughs> but pretty much all of the EU haters, all the shit you talked about us, oh, the Emperor coming back, <laughs> you did that. Disney Wars, everything that Disney Wars and all of its fanboys talk shit about the EU, you guys are now done. And, well, we did it from the 90s till 2014. You guys did it from 2014 to 2019. You guys did it in five years. <laughs> all the mistakes the EU made over a long, long time period, whether you consider mistakes or not. You guys, boom, 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 let's just knock out all of those mistakes as fast as possible. But whatever, look, if you like the movie, I'm glad you like the movie. I'm glad they finished the trilogy. They want to do more stuff with Star Wars. Well, the Mandalorian is actually really, really good. For Disney Wars stuff, I do like it. But it's also dealing with the New Republic. It's dealing with stuff that could easily fit in the EU. And I'm like, all right, I'll ride with that. But now that this, this shit is done, could we get Sword of the Jedi? Could we start making EU products? Like, keep making your Disney Wars stuff. That's fine. But could we get our stuff back since apparently you guys aren't any better at this. You guys swore up and down that, oh, it's going to be so much better. It's going to make so much more sense. It's going to be so much more coherent. Even your movies aren't coherent. Shit, watching it, I feel like I'm watching a fucking Fox X-Men movie. So can we get the EU back? Make new novels. Make both. People can understand multiple parallel timelines. People aren't stupid. Hell, Netflix is doing two different He-Man shows at the same time. People can handle it. Give us back the EU. Um, let's end on a happier note. Uh, there's an argument, since it's Christmas time, there's always this argument about whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. People are stupid. What makes a Christmas movie? Well, a Christmas movie has to have a few things. It has to take place during Christmas. Well, yes, Die Hard takes place during Christmas. It has to be about a, generally speaking, now there, there's a whole bunch of Christmas movies, but generally speaking, a Christmas movie is about somebody, generally a father, but it could be anybody, who is trying to 
give his family a good Christmas. He just, he wants, life has gotten in the way and things have gotten torn apart and everything is hectic and he just wants this one day to be perfect, just him and his family to be happy. That's what Die Hard is about. John McCain and his wife, they've had a tiff, they've gotten separated, and he wants to fix his family. He wants Christmas to be a family day where they can all get together, celebrate it together, and for once be a family again. That's what the whole goddamn movie is about. Then in these Christmas movies, generally, something happens. An outside source comes in and messes up the plans. Uh, well, that would be what Alan Rickman's character did. The end of the day, Christmas is saved. The end of the day, John McCain saved the day. Thus, Christmas is saved. All the story beats that a Christmas movie should have, Die Hard has. So, for those of the people out there, like Ralph Garman, I love him. Subscribe to the Ralph Report, you should too. Who think Die Hard is not a Christmas movie? You're fucking stupid and don't understand the concept of a goddamn Christmas movie. The only reason I'm getting angry about it is because he called people who think it is a Christmas movie stupid. And it's like, well, at least we understand what a Christmas movie is. <laughs> Love you, mean it, bye. <laughs> no. uh, well, seriously, subscribe to the Ralph Report. It's really good. For 15 cents a day, <laughs> um, him and Eddie Pence will fill you in on entertainment news and, and a whole bunch of stuff. It's, it's a really funny show. Um, but all that being said, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, hope you guys are having a good one. Um, I did a review of Friday the 13th on my friend Trey's channel, I'll put a link down below, and give us legends.